Standing Rock. I'm at the casino uh, of the Prairie Nights uh, Hotel Lodge. And this is a couple of days before we return back to Los Angeles, so the Southern California area. Uh, this video is being done as a thank you uh, to all of the people who have helped us on this pilgrimage. We almost made our goal uh, of the $8,000. Spent. And uh, uh, things have been a little bit different from September to now because obviously we're in November and this is uh, definitely a lot colder than when we, when we were here. Um, the, the demographics uh, at the camp itself have, have grown uh, and uh, when we were here in September it was about 60% Nicaragua indigenous people uh, and now it is closer to 90% Europeans. A uh, whole bunch of reasons you can think of for that. Part of it is a lot of our people can't afford to be here for a long time. Uh, so, you know, those of you uh, who are thinking of coming out here, uh, yeah, there is an expense in coming out here, whether you, even if you're going to drive out here, which we wouldn't suggest anymore at this point, because a lot of the roads from California at this point, uh, um, are going to be closed down occasionally due to snow on, on the roads or, or floods and things like that. And uh, so if you are going to go and you can afford it, fly out here. Uh, but as it goes deeper into winter, don't even try it. The other thing is it is an expense for the gasoline too. And you better have a, a car in reasonable condition also. Because we've already heard from people uh, who had so-so cars and now they got no-no cars <laughs> because uh, they broke down on them and it was too expensive to repair. Um, and if you are going to come out here, there's also the issue of the cold weather be ready from your toes to your to your head. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll post on the, with this video all the things that you, you need to do. We have uh, Pete Madeline, uh, from the Minnesota area to thank for that. He did a lot of research, plus he lives in, in this kind of weather, and he'll talk uh, about uh, things like what to wear, uh, the tent and the heating. Heating is crucial. Do not think you can come out here and sleep in your car. They're gonna find you dead you know, if, if you get to sub-zero, and you'll have nowhere to flee, especially if it's a blizzard or something that. So this is not a scare you, this is just a prepare you because we do need people to keep coming out here. You know? uh, but you also have to be realistic as far as that. In the meantime, there are a lot of good people here. Uh, we've met a lot of wonderful people while we were here. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did is to do a, a lot of videos. So when you see some of our videos where we're going through the camp and and we talk to a lot of different people. Um, and you get a little bit of the flavor of, of the place. Uh, the other thing is there were actions that took place here. Uh, last Sunday uh, was one of the worst things that happened. Uh, actually, one of the first big casualties about the young lady who ended up losing an arm for, for being uh, attacked by these criminal police. Uh, and of course, a lot of other people were injured, um, which uh, had us thinking along the lines of the, the tents that we brought. We brought uh, two tents, one of them with, uh, with heating, because we weren't able to afford for both of them. And um, we ended up uh, deciding that we were going to give the tents uh, to the medical units uh, here at the camp. And uh, it's going to work out really, really well because uh, uh, and talking to one of the doctors who's in charge of all of this, they, they needed actually uh, desperately uh, somewhere where the doctors and nurses uh, could sleep uh, for the night because it's getting a little bit more crowded and they needed some more room for storage. Um, so it, it was good timing and, and we feel really happy that we're, we were able to contribute to all of that. And at the same time, um, 
uh, we would hate to have just left the tents there and for nobody really to be able to follow through on it. Um, and as of this date, you know, there's been um, uh, an eviction notice given by the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, they are basically giving 30 days. Uh, was it 30 days? No. Ten. Ten. Ten days, I'm sorry. Talk about unreasonable. <laughs> this was a 10 day eviction notice. And um, obviously, everybody's not going to be able to move out in 10 days. Um, and a lot of the people that uh, we talk to uh, don't plan to move. And th there'll be lawsuits and pushing and pushing it. And, but in, in the end, we got Trump coming in. Uh, so most likely, uh, there will be some, some movement. But all it is is to move movement from the current camp across the river, which is about a quarter of a mile, so it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and there's plenty of open area, so it can just be replicated on the other side. It was just easier where, where the current camp is at, um, but um, it, it, it's, uh, again, uh, now the federal government uh, taking dic uh, dictatorial uh, orders from uh, DAPL and other corporations. Uh, and it's a sad thing to, to see. Uh, but it, it, it means it's just a new location. It's the same battle. Um, and uh, there's a lot of criminal activity going on by the federal government by not enforcing the laws. There's criminal activity going on at, by the governor, by the politicians of the state, and mostly by the the police and the sheriff's departments in this area that are committing crimes and not being arrested. So that's something that seems to be getting more and more intense because even for, for DAPL, it, it means that uh, it is going to be hard for them to do the work that they need to do to, just, you know, to rape into the land and plant their, their pipe un, under the, the Missouri River and under the, the, the Cannon, uh, Cannonball River. Uh, so there's a lot of things kind of still up in the earth. There are a lot of fuzzy things going on. Uh, so probably by the time uh, this video airs in another month, a lot of things are going to change. But this is the current report, the current uh, assessment we've been able to make. We're really happy that we've been able to, to give these tents, and we'll, we'll show you some, some video of you know, the, the, uh, the stove that we have that is a, a, a wood-burning stove uh, that will help keep people warm and uh, cots and sleeping bags that will help out and um, like I said, the supply tent and we're hoping that that will that, at least help, help a little bit and might give you an idea of what you can come and do when you come out here. You're going to need a tent and you're going to need some some heating, and most of us cannot stay out here very long because, you know, people have jobs, you know, you have a limited amount of money. So if you are going to come out here um, and bring all this stuff and the cold weather and all, leave the clothing behind. You're not going to need it, and at least for those of us in California. You're not going to need it out there, and you're not going to need a stove in California, a wood-burning stove. So if you can if you can afford or try to gather up the money to to do such a thing, um, probably the, the medical uh, unit will probably still need more of those tents. And if not, other people will need them. Because one of the things that we are finding out here is that there are people who are coming unprepared, without a place to stay, with, again, we're at this hotel, fully booked. Fully booked, you, you cannot get uh, a hotel room. And the nearest other town is an hour away, that's Bismarck which is incidentally, Bismarck is where you should plan to, to land if you're gonna fly out here. Don't go to the bigger cities, that's just a longer drive for you. Um, so we have a, a lot of things that you need to do some research on. And uh, please do not plan to sleep in your car. Do not come with a regular tent because you will freeze if it gets really bad. And it will get, there will be days that will be in, close to zero, if not below zero, it's hard to predict with the weather. Uh, 
then you have um, a lot of other things to, that, that we'll be updating you on uh, as the months uh, uh, and or the weeks and months go, go by. Uh, we're going to set up uh, uh, a blog that, that will update you on what is going on uh, here at Standing Rock. In the meantime, we've come out here uh, to do presentations on, on our history, on uh, the, the unknown uh, periods before 1492, what happened in the last 500 years. And uh, again, uh, the, there's uh, an action going on today at, at the bridge where the, the people uh, were attacked last Sunday by uh, again, these uh, law-breaking police officers or sheriffs, whichever they were. Sometimes it's a combination of different forces. And again, the people are just basically going in there and to present themselves in complaint. There's a whole bunch of different things about uh, the wording of what, what is being done. And I'll do the, that as a separate video to talk about, about that issue, what words are being used. But the important part are the actions, the people coming to speak, the people coming to help, whether it's medical or supplies. We run across people who are just bringing food. They come in for a couple of days and they leave, and that's beautiful. People bringing clothing uh, and uh, figure out what you can do. All right, so to maintain the stove, we got this ash bucket. As you see, we throw the ashes so we don't let it get too high, so you can fit more wood. Now, what you would want to do to start a fire, you want to get them pieces of wood like this, they'll light faster. So what you would want to do is, see in this case, it's already hot coals in there. Technically, when it's like that, all you have to do is just flatten out the coals and lay the wood in the light. But for right now, I'm just going to explain a little bit how, when there's no coals, how to actually start a fire. So what you would want to do is, kind of put the form of a teepee. for the form of the teepee when the fire starts burning the top of the flame is always the hottest and when it's in the form of the teepee it gives it the angle where the flame will actually touch you and it will actually light on fire rather than there's no coals and you put it flat the fire that the top of the flame won't really touch it so it's best to do it in the form of a teepee once you got your teepee going get a kindle and you put it in the middle Once the, the thin sticks catch on fire and they're burning good, then you can throw the bigger wood. Once the bigger wood lights, then you can shut the door. And for safety, every time we open or start a fire, it is good to have gallons of water just in case to be able to put out the fire. Or if it gets worse, we got the fire extinguisher right here. And always when this back window right here should always be open because we need oxygen, we need uh, air circulation. So always leave that open at all times while the fire is on.
So once the logs catch on fire, as you can see, they're lit. Now you can throw bigger pieces in there. Remember, don't overfill it because it will block the chimney and the smoke will come out this way. Now let me show you around. Here we got a cot. We got four sleeping bags. We got two cots, four sleeping bags. Got a pair of walkie-talkies for communication because communication and signal out here is, is pretty low. We got a few pallets to kind of elevate you from the ground. We got this kitty pool here once again so the doctors and nurses can maintain and keep it clean. Got the first aid kit right here. It's a basic first aid kit. So you saw our first tent. Now we got our second tent here, which is our storage tent. This is what the nurses, doctors, and the medic staff will be using. Here we keep our firewood, our water, our kitchens, kitchen stuff our food you know pretty much we want to once again we want to thank the members the supporters and the donators for making all this possible and the the doctors nurses and the medic staff for doing what they do and helping our warriors and our people and involved in direct action thank you so we provided an axe to chop wood for those of you that don't know how to chop wood pretty much you want to grab the axe like about right here. You want to raise it as high as you can just go straight out. Hey folks. Uh, this is what, what we've uh, brought. This is what we've brought out here. Is uh, These are uh, replicas of, of mine codices here. We brought two of them. And um, I'm looking for the, the cases to them, which I believe are down here. Okay. And one of them is called the uh, Codas Loud. They're both they're famous because you've probably seen uh, some pictures of them uh, on the internet. And, uh, and this other one is called the Fayer. Barry Mayer. I've, I've, never been, I've never learned how to pronounce that first part of the word. Um, and, uh, and what we'll do is uh, we'll show you some of the segments from the codices. Uh, and we also brought uh, a copy of uh, the Florentine Codex, which is this one. Uh, this is book six. There are 12 volumes of this. This is from the 1500s. It was a study uh, by a, uh, a Spanish priest named uh, Sagun, who was commissioned by the Spanish government to study us as a people. And he did everything from uh, what are the foods that we eat? How, how do we educate our people? Keeping in mind that we were living in cities. This is where he was. It, these were not the tribal wandering people. And that's one of the things that we all have to kind of like realign ourselves uh, and how we see ourselves, or even for the Europeans who are viewing this. Uh, the majority of our people were actually living in cities and large towns. The tribal uh, population was about 10 to 20 percent. So that's a little hard for us to, and, you know, everything that we know, it goes against that. But uh, this, the Florentine Codex, uh, like Book 6, which is uh, the most important part, it, it's uh, the philosophy, the morality. Uh, one of the things, practically everything, is, was very different uh, uh, the, from the way the Europeans looked at the world, the way we looked at the, at the world. In the European Christianity, you know, there was an afterlife and that you were going to be punished or rewarded for how you lived your life. In, in our world, uh, the cosmology or our understanding of the Creator 
had no more outlet to you. There, there was no, no more outlet. It was, it was an issue of more science than anything else, a, a scientific understanding of, of uh, the universe. And as far as morality, we did have morality, but this was civil. This was something that the, the border societies maintained uh, in terms of everything from stealing and killing and, and adultery and all that. That was dealt with not in the afterlife. That was dealt with now. And uh, it was very severe. But no more severe than what was going on in Europe. One of the ma main things that happens uh, in, when we first encounter anything about our civilizations is this whole idea that the Europeans had about human sacrifice. And it always shows, oh, they're pulling out hearts with savages. But in the meantime, in Europe, what was going on? There was the Inquisition. And you had women being burned alive simply for being thinkers, for being doctors, for questioning uh, uh, the sexism in the Bible. They were executed. In the, and, and when they were being burned alive, the priest went up and said, in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and burn the witch. That's human sacrifice. It's documented that well over 300,000 uh, human beings in Europe were burned during, during uh, the, basically the Middle Ages in, into the period of uh, the 1700s. So human sacrifice has pretty much been going on in Europe a lot more than it's been going on throughout our whole continent. But this whole thing about human sacrifice has been a way to uh, slander our people, a, a way to... Uh, destroy any sort of pride in who we are. Oh, you want to study about those Aztecs? You know, why, why, why would you want to be part of that human sacrifice? You want to do human sacrifices? Is that why you want to do that? Uh, then people get turned off to investigating any more of our own history. And one of the things uh, that's sad about this is, first of all, we didn't call ourselves Aztecs. Even the Spaniards did not call us Aztecs. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings about our identity. Or, uh, what the Spaniards were calling us was Indians. Obviously, we're not, we're not in India. And, and it's been 500 years, and that has not been corrected. We have our own people calling themselves Indians, even though there is a country named India, and those are the, those are the, the Indians. So you can't get beyond the, the, the simple things like correcting Indians or why are we called Aztecs when we call ourselves Mexica? At least those of us who live in, in the Mexica area. Um, and it goes into this whole thing about it being called Hispanics or Latinos. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that, that but uh, other than to say an Hispanic is a Spaniard, a European. A Latino comes from the word Latin, the language of the Romans, and that refers to Southern Europeans. And we are neither Spaniards nor Southern Europeans. Just do some basic uh, research into a dictionary before 1980 because the dictionaries have been revised to adjust to this act of genocide. We're not going to talk too much about genocide because there are some videos that are, gonna, that were, are part of this presentation that will explain genocide to you. And uh, so, you know, when it comes down to this history, uh, just with the Florentine Codex, a lot of people don't believe it. So you guys had, yeah, you didn't have cities, and you just had like this one pyramid and human sacrifices on it. No, we had, the largest city was 350,000 people. And we had uh, a total of five cities just in the northern part of this continent, which is called North and South America. Uh, in this continent, uh, we had five cities that were larger than any of the cities of Europe. The largest city in, in Europe uh, went toggled back and forth between uh, Paris and London. Those are 80,000. We had the Nochtilan with 350,000. We had Texcoco with 80,000. We had Puecho uh, Cinco, Tlaxcala, and Cholula. And then uh, we had Cusco down in what's called the, the Peru area or the Inca area. And then, of course, we had other cities uh, that were you know, 50,000 and 20,000, and the average was about 10,000, which is 
better than what Europe was doing at the time. So, Florentine Codex, you need to be aware of the Florentine Codex. Uh, there are 12 volumes, some talk about our foods, some talk about our cosmology, which is called uh, religion, which is, uh, it's not a religion, but they want to force that on us. We're not Hispanics, but they want to force that on us. Uh, this is still our continent, but they want to force our ownership off of us. There are a lot of things that, that you need to study and you need to question. Uh, the next book is um, it's called uh, The Dresden Codex. And this is a very ancient book, but this is a, a new publication of it. Um, and I don't remember how much it is. It's, it's not that, that expensive of a book. And, and we'll, we'll do some close-ups of this so you can see you know, this beautiful book. And you'll see the numbering system. And this is a, basically a book on astronomy. We had better knowledge of astronomy than the Europeans or anybody else in the world. We had a better understanding of mathematics than the Europeans. We invented our own mathematics. The Europeans did not invent any mathematics. They got their mathematics out of the Middle East. What are called Arabic numerals, so obviously they came from the Arabs. But the Arabs actually didn't invent them either. They came from India. And uh, the concept zero uh, that is so famous, well, we came up with the concept of zero before India, because it is a concept that was developed in India. And um, we also had a more accurate calendar. Uh, and actually, our calendar is still more accurate than the calendar, that, that the Gregorian calendar that we're using today. The only thing, uh, more accurate as far as time is to use atomic time. So, again, the Dresden Codex. And, and then there are other codices uh, that we didn't bring because, again, they're, they're larger and they would, they would have been more difficult for us to transport. But this is uh, the Ludan Codex. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. It's about $20. $20. Uh, and we'll show you some clips from this in this video. And as you can see, this is very unusual art that most of us have never seen. And uh, there, there are other, other codices available uh, that are a lot, lot less expensive than these. Uh, these fold that are kind of like a accordion. This is more the way we did our books. Again, it was kind of like an accordion. And these were double-sided, as you can see. And uh, some were about this size, some were way larger, you know, depending on the region, depending on the purpose of the books. And, uh, but if you just buy them, which these are pretty expensive now, actually, these are out of print. But if you just look at them, you're not going to be able to figure out what you're looking at. There are other books that explain them to you. But again, these are from a European point of view. Uh, very few of our people get into re doing real study of the codices, but it is about our culture. It is about our writing systems. And this one, you can see it there. I mean, it looks just like, you know, just art. But this is actually how we did science. This is our equivalent of E equals MC squared, dealing with uh, science uh, because it's something that we were very obsessed with. That's why we knew so much about astronomy. That's why we knew so much about a lot of different things, including medicine. One of the things that, that astounded the Spaniards was our medicine, because it actually was better than that of Spain. And when the, the, the people in Spain found out about this, and why, why are our, our soldiers, because that's mostly what they were sending, why are our soldiers so stubborn about getting their, their doctors from, from these Indians. Well, because they were effective. The medicines worked, the therapy worked, whatever it is that they needed. We had a better way of even healing battle wounds. We had a better way of healing broken bones. Uh, there were a lot of different medicines to deal with a lot of different issues that, that come up with human beings. So our medicine and our astronomy. But we were also the first people in the history of the world to have mandatory education for males and females.
We had a great hygiene system where uh, we bathed every day. And that's one of the things that freaked out the Spaniards. Uh, they thought we were, that was part of fanatical religion, the fact that we were bathing every day. At least in the cities we were doing that. And because in those days, uh, the 1500s, the Europeans didn't bathe at all in their whole lives. So imagine the smell of Europeans in Europe. And that's kind of what confounded our people when, when they arrived. And that's the first thing you noticed about them, the smell. Actually, the Japanese and the Chinese made the same comment uh, when they would write about the Europeans. Says, These people, they don't bathe at all, and they don't see it as anything wrong. Because amongst other people who never bathe, what are they talking about? You know, <laughs> they, they, they all smell. Um, but this gets into the whole thing about the Europeans consider themselves the most clean people in the world. They are the white race. Well, none of the people in the world who encountered them called them white. They called them pale. They called them discolored. They called them a whole bunch of them, but not white. That's a, a name that the Europeans gave themselves, or they translated it as white for them. Because white is good. White is clean. White is something that is pure, there's nothing but positive things. And anything dark is evil, is bad. It, it's all part of the, the, the materials and the language of white supremacy. So we have uh, this stuff of, of ours, it's part of our history, these books. Uh, but if we read them like Europeans, it's going to do us no good. That's why we need people to be doing the research and looking at this stuff again and seeing it for the science that it is, not superstition and not weird art. Um, and the art is actually very beautiful, but most, of, most people have never seen this art. And it's also sad because you're not going to be seeing this in Chicano studies other than maybe one page in a book. You're going to be spending a lot of time on the Chicano period of the 60s or the, the farm laborers, but you won't learn anything about how ancient our civilizations are. Going back to uh, 3700 BC, which is older than any civilization in Europe. And also remember, the Europeans didn't invent any civilization. The Greeks and the Romans are offshoots of the Middle East. They didn't invent any writing system. The, right, the Latin writing script is out of the Middle East. The, the new, numerical stuff, the science, it, it all originated in the Middle East. And what's going on in the Middle East? The Europeans are controlling and they're trying to get the oil out of them. They're destroying basically the root of their civilization. But at the same time, the, the Europeans try to take credit with the inventions of agriculture, the inventions of steel, the inventions of everything that the Middle East did by, instead of saying Middle East, they talk, they talk about Western civilization. Something that they be, the Germans were there with the Sumerians, the Germans were there with the Assyrians, the Germans were there. The Germans were nowhere near any of that. The Germans never invented agriculture or any civilization. So you, you need to kind of uh, really look deep into the Europeans themselves. There are lies upon lies upon lies. And one of the, the things that you need to know also is that there was an American Holocaust. And this is a book called American Holocaust by David Stanley. And part of the, the difficulty of reading a book like this is because it's a uh, a history of things of the last 500 years that most of us had never even heard. It wasn't taught to us in grammar school or high school or universities. And uh, when you first hear of it, of these cities that existed here, it sounds made up. It sounds like science fiction. And uh, when it gets down to the genocide, the, the Holocaust that took place here, killing 95% of our people. That's 100 million human lives that Europeans did. The first thing will come to your mind, there's no way we could kill 100 million people. There weren't, there, there weren't that many people here, or 
there weren't that many Europeans to, who could have killed all of us. Well, there was something called smallpox being used as, as a biological weapon. And um, it became uh, standard to say, uh, oh, well, it was an accident. Yeah, there was smallpox that spread, but it was an accident. It was an accident when the Europeans first used it on the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, wiping out 100% of the Canary Islanders. It was an accident when they used it in, in the Caribbean, wiping out in some islands 100% of the population, wiping out in, in general 95 to 98% of the population. That's why at one point they started importing Africans as slaves to repopulate. But there are no Jamaicans left. There were. Uh, tens of thousands of, of our people on, on, on the island of Jamaica, there are no Jamaicans left. There are nothing but Africans there. And when you think about it, okay, that's a lot of people wiped out. That's just the beginning of it. Because then they went and they used the same weapon to wipe out the populations of the cities of what are called the Aztecs, which are really the Mexica uh, and the Mayan areas. And they went in there because uh, smallpox is a very contagious disease. And if, if your husband or wife uh, gets uh, the smallpox, your instinct is to try to help them. And you touch them, and now you become infected. And your other relatives try to come and help you. So it spreads like fire. Especially if you're in a city, because the population is so concentrated, and, and the Europeans need because they had experiences in, in Europe, or, or, uh, going back to the back Black Plague, which most of us have a little bit of that. But this is something that the Europeans did worldwide. They did it in Mexico, they did it in the missions in California. Every one of the 21 missions, 90 to 95% of the population of our people was killed with smallpox. And you can go, uh, again, with uh, Jamestown, you can go into the, the areas of Florida, you can go into all parts of this continent and you'll see the 90 to 95 percent. And some of the smaller populations, it was 100 percent extinction, where we don't even know the names of, our, of those tribes or bands of our people that existed at that point. So that's American Holocaust. It's a very difficult book to read. You cannot read this book, you know, beyond 10 pages uh, without getting angry. At least our people, but there, there are some Europeans who do understand that this is something very evil that was done to our people. So yeah, we were killed so that Europeans could have free land, because there was nowhere, nowhere in Europe they were going to get free land and free, free wealth and free slaves. That was all for the nobility, who were just basically, they're called kings and queens and dukes and barons and all that, but they were just mafias. Think of them as mafias and it becomes a lot easier to understand. Um, and here's another book. It's called American, oh, I'm sorry, Encyclopedia of American Indian Contributions of the World. So it's uh, part of the things that I was saying about astronomy, the thing, things that I was saying about mathematics and, and medicine and uh, a whole bunch of other things. This book already exists. This book uh, exists uh, to the uh, to the point that it's almost going out of print and yet people don't even know that it exists. So if you get a chance, get your hands on it. There's a hard, hard cover and a paper, paperback uh, version of this and you'll be surprised about how many things we've given to the world. Uh, things like corn and potatoes, uh, chilies and tomatoes and chocolate and vanilla. Those are some of the foods and even simple things like rubber, you know, that, that we're, uh, we're using on most of our shoes or, you know, people who chew gum, you know, that's something that we were doing. Uh, the peanuts, uh, you, you can go on with a, a big list of, of the foods and, and other, other inventions uh, of our people. But we're not really taught about those things. Uh, but then on the other end of it, you know, like I was saying, the sciences, the medicines, that should be something we should be proud of, but also the fact that we had cities, that we had uh, public toilets, whereas the Europeans in those days uh, threw all, remember what smell? You think they're going to be smelling, you know, the stuff that they threw out their window. 
Um, so it's a lot of different things to absorb. You know, because at this point, people who are totally new to all of this are going to say, this guy's making this all up. This is science fiction or something. But it's not science fiction. And you don't have to believe me. You can uh, do your own research. A good book to start out is this Charles Mann, uh, Before Columbus, uh, The Americas in 1491. And then you find out about these cities and these inventions and how ancient our civilizations are. So do yourself a favor and check out this. And, and we're gonna, on this video, uh, we're going to have a little section on there of the books that we recommend. Okay, so now I'm going to take you over here to this other section to tell you a little bit more about uh, Mexica movement. But we're going to give you this video right now, which gives you a, a good summary.